Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gospel Tech Podcast. My name is Nathan Sutherland, and this podcast is dedicated to helping families love God and use tech. Today, we are going to be answering the question, what can we do for analog adventures? This idea of we want something that is not digital, it does not involve drool tech. So what do we do? How do we find something that's engaging, that lines up with our kid, that we can fit into our life, that actually fits like our time schedule and the space we have in our house, right? Like how do we make it practically work? Because it's a great idea. Of course, we want our kids to have really fun things that are healthful for them, but how do we find it? So we're going to answer those questions today. Uh, The general idea of this being, I want you to be encouraged. There are really cool real world, world, excuse me, real world experiences that your kid can participate in that you can even do with them sometimes uh, that really extend who they are and who God has made them to be rather than simply uh, maybe distract them from that. So with no further ado, let's get this conversation started. Welcome to the Gospel Tech Podcast, a resource for parents who are feeling outpaced and overwhelmed as they raise children in a tech world. As an educator, parent, and tech user, I want to equip parents with the tools, resources, and confidence they need to raise kids who love God and use tech. Thank you to everyone who has made this podcast possible. Uh, If you have liked this podcast, if you have subscribed to it, if you have reviewed it or rated it, thank you. If you've shared it with a friend, thank you. And if you have not, and you have listened to maybe more than two or three of these podcast episodes, would you consider doing that? Uh, It helps people find us. It helps this resource reach more people. And that is our big emphasis for this year, is extending the work of Gospel Tech to more people who need these resources, who need to hear the gospel, and who need healthful and helpful resources to equip them so they can raise kids who love God and use tech, so they can raise healthy youth, really, in a tech world, right? That's our focus. So thank you for helping us with that. Um, We did just finish our big uh, fundraiser of the year. This is kind of a, it's an interesting thing because here in the Northwest, uh, the COVID rules are kind of developing, but this past week, things were still open. uh, And we were able to hold a live fundraiser. That's amazing. And I just want to share, I guess, a blessing of what the Lord has done. Um, We brought a bunch of people in. We basically didn't get to see them at all in 2020. 2019, we made this announcement, hey, we're going to look at gospel tech. We'd worked three years, Anna and I being the we, along with our board. We worked three years with this nonprofit saying, hey, we're going to spark positive purpose in youth. In 2019, we came out and said, you know, that's going to look like gospel tech. That's going to be our focus right now. And then the world shut down. (laughs) And so we got out in front of these people and we said, hey, here's what we've done, right? We have a website in gospeltech.net. We have an online workshop and a workbook to go with it. If you go to gospeltechworkshop.net, Dot com, or if you just go to gospeltech.net and go under resources, you'll see it there. Uh, it's a really helpful tool to help families build a tech framework to understand how do we apply the gospel. We have a podcast, we have social media, uh, and we're developing new tools, and we have some really cool announcements uh, pending. I don't usually tease stuff, but I am going to tease this because our new focus is uh, continuing with our live workshops. Okay, that's our first thing we're going to do is keep equipping families to love God and use tech, and that's done in person. So if you know a church or a school who's interested in a resource like that, uh, you can contact me, Nathan, at gospeltech.net. We are traveling. We are opening up uh, kind of our window because we're in a spot where we can do that now, thanks to generous donors. Uh, We are going to be teaming with like-minded organizations. We have a, a bigger organization than us who wants to bring us on as their tech arm. We're excited to announce that, but it's probably a few more weeks, probably like middle of September, late September, uh, when that's more formalized. But we are in conversation to basically reach more families in that uh, venue, and we're really excited about that. And then the third is teaming with schools and churches. Uh, And the schools and churches that we will be teaming with here locally in the Northwest, uh, it's all about culture change. It's more than just how does Nathan come in and fix our kids in an hour, right, <laughs> with this workshop? But how do we extend this conversation from this is good stuff to do to this actually makes sense? Like we are, these are Christian schools, so they are Bible-based, and how do you 
how do you actually apply the Bible, right? Like, how do you live it out in faith, not just in rules, not just uh, making new little Pharisees who are self-righteous, but actually making humble followers of Jesus who love God and use tech because of their love of God rather than loving tech and using God when it's convenient. So uh, if that's interesting to you, please uh, get a hold of us. We are excited for that. And if it's uh, just something that you needed to hear, I hope it's encouraging to you because uh, the work of some wonderful, generous individuals has allowed us to continue this as our full-time ministry. Uh, And we are very excited to do it. And I'm excited for today's conversation about analog adventures. So analog adventure, this idea that it's a non-digital adventure. And I want to talk about some of these specifics. So I think in starting, let's look at some verses for today. We're going to go with Matthew 18, 8 through 9. Uh, This idea that it really setting the stage with Jesus says, you need to remove anything that causes you to sin, causes you to give your worship and set your hope on anything other than God, right? So he says, and if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. He has just said, by the way, a little context, he just said, uh, sin's going to happen, but woe to the one through whom it happens, okay? And he, this is repeating something he actually says in Matthew 5, 19 as well, where he's speaking specifically on lust in that section, but this is just bigger picture. Sin's going to come, woe to the one through whom it comes, and then he says, and if your right hand, or, f- or in this case, your f- hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off, and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life, crippled or lame, than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes be thrown into the hell of fire. And the idea here being, one, there are real consequences to some of our decisions. They can harden our hearts right? They can cause us to worship something other than God. And he's saying when that happens, when sin enters, sin leads to death. Unrepentant sin is not something we want hanging around. And when we're repentant, we make changes. And so he's saying, listen, if that thing's super important to you, it might be as important as an eye or your right hand, right? The, the symbol in his culture of something that is absolutely critical. In this case, he's saying, if your right hand, that most important thing to you, causes you to sin, it's not that important, right? Get rid of it. So that's we're holding that in mind, right? We've talked before about, how, well, how do I know if my tech is healthy and what, what can I do if it's a problem, right? We have talking about resets and drool tech and that stuff. So this is our biblical standard. Drool tech is all expendable. It can be really important to us. It could be an expression of how God made us, but if it causes us to sin, at least for a season, it needs to go away. Uh, and then I guess I wanted to set the standard uh, for furthering that conversation with Matthew 7, 7 through 11. When we talk about God as a good father, uh, when we remove and replace, when we see something negative in tech and we take it away and now we're, we're giving these analog adventures as... Um, a replacement, it's not a punishment, right? We're not doing this because we're mad at our kids or to teach them a lesson or to give them some kind of back in my day, uphill both ways in the snow lesson. Uh, This is instead the standard for good that God gives us. Uh, Jesus tells us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if your son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? This is, again, Matthew 7, 7 through 11. And I love this because this is our standard for parenting, right? It's God. Um, So God is our standard for good, and he's also our standard as a parent— And he's like, uh, Jesus is saying, if you know how to give good things to your kids, first of all, assuming we do, (laughs) and saying like, your kid asks for something that is helpful to them, it's beneficial, it's keeping them strong, it's keeping them safe, like you're going to give those things to your kid because you delight in giving them good things, right? So if you do that, think about what God does for you, because God doesn't just give you what you ask for, God actually gives you what you need. And this is what we can pray into as parents. We don't just want to be giving our kids things that are good or not that bad. We actually want them to be having the things that make them the most aware of who God is, help them see God the best, uh, 
And sometimes that involves taking things away, and sometimes that involves giving them great things. So just keep that in mind. That is, that is the standard we have. Uh, we are going to ask God for the wisdom. We are going to ask God for new hearts. We are going to ask God uh, that He would regenerate us and help us love our children as He loves them. And out of that, when our children ask us for stuff, we're going to say yes to as many good things as we can. In fact, even when they ask for bad stuff, some of our kids are going to ask for a snake, right? And we're going to go, no, 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 but look at this really good fish, right? <clears throat> I want you to have that. It's going to help you. So that's that's what kind of is my mindset in heading into this. So we have these analog adventures. They're real world adventures. First question is, how do you find one, right? Like, great. We have this idea. Of course, I want my kid to do something awesome, but how do I find it? I will say there's kind of one of three uh, ways to find this. We're going to look at I guess there are three parts of the same idea, but interests, passions, and giftings. I'd say these are different facets, kind of the same uh, concept, but basically your kid has been made by God to find delight and joy uh, in specific things and really to be gifted in a certain way. Just in looking at my own children, right? I can see that as seven, five, and two-year-olds, uh, there are certain things that are unique about each of them that God has wired them a certain way. So for Owen, he has a love of structure and order. Like it just, his brain gets happy when structure and order happen. Uh, so he's going to have certain activities that line up with that. With Henry, he loves being funny. Like his entire world revolves around doing funny things, making people laugh, and he just loves that. And for Hadley, she loves anything that involves people or animals, uh, which seems like a broad category, and it is. Uh, if she walks into a crowd of strangers, she's happy. If she sees a cow on the side of the road, there are shrieks of joy. Uh, so their activities are going to differ because of that. So when we're thinking of these activities uh, with our children and for our children, involving this conversation and be like, well, what do you what do you love to do? Or even in the negative activities, hey, I see you love that game, but we also see some negative output. Or we see you love social media, but we're seeing negative reset impacts, right? Your relationships and responsibilities, your emotions, sleep, enjoyment, your time, thus impacted by this, you know, technological output. So instead, like, what about that makes you tick, right? That's what we want to get down to. So for Owen, he loves scheduled time when he can do something like Legos with his cousin. Sometimes it's live, sometimes it's over Zoom, but he he lives for that, right? Like he loves that. It's it's a specific time of the week. He can look forward to it, right? There's parameters. Legos have rules. Like he loves that. Uh, for Henry, uh, he actually loves to go out on dates. So like, oh, or sorry, not. Anna or I will take Henry out and he wants to go out for ice cream and he wants to like tell stories and just be silly. Like that's what he wants to do. Uh, desserts very well may be his spirit animal. Uh, and Hadley, right, it can be anything from visiting a zoo to a farm to honestly walking into the pet store. Like she goes nuts when she sees the 20 foot tall uh, animal pictures. Like that's something she loves to do. So we just keep that in mind because the same activity is not going to work for each kid. And the purpose of these, I think, just want to drill this home, is to be able to find things that uh, help our children find joy. God has designed them a certain way, uh, and the more they can tap into who God has made them to be, and the more they can recognize, man, I've been I've been equipped with certain gifts and talents that God wants me to use for His glory, right? That's Ephesians 2.10. We've been saved for good works, and these good works are going to involve our strength. They're going to involve the way we're made. We're the body of Christ, and we all are different parts of the body with different skills, uh, and that doesn't mean don't do something just because you're not good at it, uh, or just because you don't feel like it or feel quote unquote called to it. There are things we're all called to sharing the gospel, making disciples, loving our neighbor, loving our enemies. We're called to those things. It's not just whether we feel like it, but within that, there's a lot of ways to love your neighbor. There's a lot of ways to love your enemies. Um, we're going to forgive them with the strength we're given in Christ, and then we're going to act our love out in certain ways. And that's going to involve what we're talking about right now. So this is not, here's what analog adventures are not. They're not um, the back in my day lessons we're trying to teach our kids. <clears throat> this is not a way to trick our children into hanging out with us and doing what we like to do. And it's not a way of forcing our children into doing what we want them to do, right? Uh, I will give an, ex an example done well. My dad loves golf. 
uh, growing up. My dad still loved golf, and I have never clicked with golf. So he would take me golfing. He enjoys golf. It's a way we would hang out even into adulthood, right? Take me on beautiful uh, golf courses. They're great. They're lovely. It's just I'm terrible at it. I, I'm not good, uh, and I fatigue out pretty quick on golf. And so, like, it's not a regular thing we do. We maybe go once a year. I think it's been a couple years at this point, uh, thanks to COVID, that I, since I've been golfing. But my dad was okay with that, right? He didn't force me into being uh, a golfer. Instead, he encouraged me to go take other courses and uh, other other sports and other classes. Uh, and I got really into wrestling and football, and that was fun for me. My son Owen actually has shown a propensity to love golf, and so I'm actually encouraging him to take that up, right? We're taking him out. He'll go to the driving range. He actually appears to be quite good. Uh, and that's awesome. Like, good for him. It's not something I love to do, but it's something that he likes. There's lots of rules and order in golf, and there's lots of opportunities for growth. So I'm going to encourage it. Uh, and it's not just on sports. Like, my mom was a firm believer that we should all learn an instrument. So me and my four sisters, we all took piano lessons, and we had to take them through elementary school. And it was pretty painful for me. Like 20 to 30 minute lesson is brutal, right? That's very hard for me to do. I never remember to practice. Even when I did remember, I actively fought it. Uh, whereas, right, like by the time I became a middle schooler, I, I quit that. My mom didn't say, well, you have to go play a, uh, an instrument. Instead, she encouraged me to try something else. I got into choir. I enjoyed that. I was okay at it. Uh, and ended up getting into like school musicals and stuff, right? Because it's more social. It's not me playing by myself. It's me practicing this art form with other people. And yes, there are pictures somewhere out there of me wearing lederhosen for the sound of music, but that's not the point. The point is my parents displayed really, really well what it looks like to encourage our kids in pursuing analog adventures. It's not picking something we wish they would do and telling them they're going to do it. Uh, it's encouraging them and giving them opportunities and recognizing what makes them tick. And if music is an important outlet or something you have available, Maybe you keep trying different instruments, and maybe it's not the first one or the one that you like the most, uh, but it's going to be something along the line that they do fall in love with, and they can realize this is a lifelong thing they can take with them. Uh, and I can tell you, in teaching, theater pays off huge dividends. Uh, if you ever want to become a teacher, please go to a theater class uh, and <laughs> learn just the ability to stay composed under duress. It will help. So... That is the first part of our conversation, this big picture of how do we find great activities? We look at the interests, the passion, the gifting that God has already wired our children for, and we simply recognize, man, every kid's going to be different. This isn't about us or what we hope for, but instead, it's about being loving parents and prayerfully seeking out what makes our kid tick. That's the initial conversation. If you can't think of anything yet, that's where you're going to go is, man, look at my child. What do they love? What do they do? What do they effortlessly give their attention effortlessly, excuse me, what do they effortlessly give their attention, their finance, uh, their their time to, right? Like, what do they invest in uh, just easily? And then kind of walk through that. Uh, then there's some categories. So I've already mentioned art. Uh, we'll look at art today with a little bit different tack, but you have things like board games and books and building and clubs. You have uh, things in nature, whether that's hiking or gardening or sports, which I mentioned already, and things like social stories and reading. Uh, when I say social, I mean interactive. So reading out loud or making up stories or writing your own, right? <clears throat> and even just working. Uh, hard work can be a gift from God. So uh, not backbreaking work, but intentional work where we invest our time and we kind of enter that space of flow, right? Where you lose track of what you're doing because you're so invested in a project. That's a gift to give our kids to recognize that that's an option, that there's something that that's engaging that isn't designed to be distracting. It's not that they're getting rewards so much that they're not aware of the world around them, which is what social media and video games specifically can do, uh, but is actually something of like, no, this is a long, slow process. And if you get invested in it, we see that click. And there's certain things that make each of us do that, that operate at the speed of real life, but that we can just lose ourselves in. And those can be really cool when done in right ways. So let's look at just three of those categories. First category, art. I am not talking about if your kid is a gifted artist. I am talking about the value of doing something you're bad at. And maybe 
you'll develop a skill where you're actually very good at communicating visually, uh, <laughs> but maybe not, and that's okay. Uh, the idea here is simply, one, God is a, an incredible artist. I mean, you're talking about the God who invented the galaxy and stars and all the colors and the ocean and sunrises. Like our God loves beauty and uses that to express his love for us, that we can enjoy that and that we are wired to enjoy that. So we can in turn express both the beautiful and the difficult in this world. And that can be really good uh, in drawing specifically and in painting and in those mediums. Um, art can be a wonderful way for our kids to just kind of step back, try something new, maybe even express themselves as they get to that point. Uh, but I'll tell you, my kids, they love Art Hub Kids. Uh, it's just a YouTube channel. It's free. They have some paid content if you want, but we use the free stuff. And like yesterday, Henry was doing it. I think he made a back-to-school monster, I believe, was the lesson. And it's basically this guy, and he has four kids. Uh, he's done it for a decade. So you watch his oldest son go from, you know, a, a five or six year old to now a 16 year old or so. And, uh, and they just draw it. It's a top down, like you're looking at their paper, you can hit pause as often as you need. They show you these kind of silly things. And it's a chance for kids to just practice and you put up their artwork and you you get to celebrate and praise the effort that they put into that, right? And the trying they did. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out something to do with art. There are art lessons. There's, you know, painting nights you can go to locally if you want to get into that. But something with art can be a really neat opportunity to work through the frustration of how hard it is to color and to draw. Uh, it's not easy for all of us. Second would be books uh, and reading. And this can be as simple as just hey, we're going to set aside time today and we're going to have you read a book independently. Uh, some younger kids, that's not going to work. So maybe it's an audio book while they play with blocks or they do a drawing or something, right? Like maybe it's some combination of activities uh, or maybe it's a read aloud and you're doing this in the middle of the day. You're doing this before bedtime. Uh, but books are an amazing way to build vocabulary, which is one of the number one indicators for success academically. Uh but it's also an opportunity for our kids to build empathy or our kids to uh, build a sense of wonder and getting stories that help them understand those things in a positive way. There are some stories that aren't worth hearing, okay? So we're not saying that. But especially as your kids get older, there are big concepts that are hard to learn just from facts. Like, well, this thing happened in history, so know it. Like, okay, but that doesn't really help me connect with the humanity of that story. And so there are great stories, both fictional and nonfiction, uh, that do a wonderful job of conveying a greater sense, I'm going to use this word, truth, uh, but that reflects the truth of, of who God is and what God says is true about us in our world. So um, it can be as simple as little picture books. So like our kids love How to Train a Train or Goldfish on Vacation or anything by Richard Scarry uh, or actually Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, now, I can't blanket suggest Calvin and Hobbes for you. I don't I don't know your family. Uh, Calvin is an incredible, rude little punk. Uh, but it's also genius. My kids belly laugh and I get like these aha moments reading this, you know, 30 years later because I'm reading the original Calvin and Hobbes books I had grown up. Uh, and man, deep, deep thoughts some evenings. I'm like, oh, that's true. That is what happens with marketing. Like he has these really insightful views on kind of how our culture works and how we choose value. So they can be simple books like that. There's books for kind of younger kids like Paddington Bear or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Matilda, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Winnie the Pooh, Mouse and the Motorcycle. Uh, lots, of, lots of just fun stories that are fun to enjoy with one another. And if you're into audiobooks, there are great options. My boys are into Narnia and The Hobbit, uh, which probably is heavily influenced by their nerd dad. But the point is, and we're picking stories that align with our family expectations that reflect the wonder and the awe and the adventure of what God's calling us onto uh, and into, and then that are safe for their hearts and minds. I'm not going to expose them to maybe even some stories I enjoy that just aren't helpful for five and seven-year-old brains. Um, oh, and the, oh man, the, oh, I'm going to forget what it's called, guys. It's the, like, I Lived Through series. I survived. It's called I Survived. Uh, and it's like sometimes it's I survived a shark attack or I survived, uh, I survived this, you know, Pompeii. Uh, but just do know that whatever you read on those, they can be really traumatic. There's the I Survived Titanic one. Uh, and there's definitely a part where like some people get like locked in the lower 
class quarters where they're like not the rich people and then they just get like stuck there and then the ship goes down and our kids are like, what happened to those people? And we're like, oh man, didn't see that coming. So maybe pre-read the I Survived, I guess. Uh, but books can be an amazing option as well uh, to do together, to do alone. Two books if you need resources and you're like, great, those are, book options are great, Nathan, but where else can you go? Honey for a Child's Heart and the Read Aloud Revival. Read Aloud Revival uh, has social media content as well that you just kind of will post book lists seasonally, or you can subscribe and get like regular monthly book lists sent to you. So some options for you. Uh, Board games would be a third adventure option. And board games are awesome because they happen at the pace of real life. Uh, They engage relationships. Very few games are solo play. Uh, They improve frustration tolerance, right? This ability to handle... Just when things don't go your way, um, that's actually a study and an article written by Regine Galanti. Uh, And they do build what we would call pro-social habits, right? The ability to take turns, the ability to uh, talk out (laughs) feelings with another, uh, to really delay gratification and to really handle anxiety. Like you're constantly in this tension of you don't know how it's going to end. And those are all good things. So Board games are not just a bias that Nathan loves board games. They actually have a lot of research showing they can be really beneficial and uh, they don't have the constant stimulation of a video game, but you can get a lot of the fun. That being said, please remember parents, the board games don't, aren't magical. They don't make it good just because it's a board game. There are games that are not worth playing. Please make sure whatever games your kid, kids play line up with your family expectations. So here's a few. <clears throat> Let's run through them. First, for young kiddos, something like Hi-Ho Cherio, uh, which Hadley actually can play. You spin a little dial, get a color, and you get like these little fruit, right? And place them in your bucket. And that's it. That's like literally the entire game. Or the dog eats the fruit. That's your option. Uh, Or something like Trouble, where you click and then it shows you a dice and you like move that many spaces. So those are simple, kind of introductory Uh, A little bit step, I guess, above those would be what we call Meow Marie, but it's actually Pete the Cat memory game. Uh, It just got called Meow Marie one time by one of our kids, so we call it Meow Marie. Uh, And it's literally just memory, and you have all these multicolored Pete the Cat pictures. So something, they have Ninja Turtles, they have, I mean, Moana. You can get memory in any theme you desire, so you can find that, and that's also fabulous and can be played with kids. I mean, three, four years old, they can start to pick up on this idea of Hadley does it, she just can never remember where the other one is. But Henry and Owen, both in on it. So then if you got kids a little bit older, um, you can modify a game, by the way, like Pictionary. Our kids like it, but they can't draw very well. So they love to just have everyone draw the same picture, then we just compare. So we literally set the little one-minute timer, we give whatever the thing is, we let each kid pick a thing off the card, and we read them for Henry, right? And we're like, all right, you're going to draw a bear at a picnic. And then like everyone draws that uh, together and then you pass around your example and they they really enjoy that. So the beautiful part about board games is you only have to follow the rules you want to follow. House rules are a thing. So Pictionary is great. A game called Dixit where uh, you basically have a these cards that have lovely little pictures on them and then you try to get people in the group to guess what the picture is with a one word clue. It's kind of like reverse apples to apples. Uh, I would say some of the pictures in that game are a little <clears throat> dark. Like there's one that has like a a shadow of a werewolf that kind of freaks the kids out. So just keep that in mind. I I love the game Dixit. I think there's four different versions out now. So just when you buy the game or when you use it, just make sure you flip through the cards first. Uh, And if you have older kids, maybe 10 and up, code names, uh, there's nothing inappropriate about it, but 10 and up because you have to know what all the words on the board are in order for the game to work. But another like... You're working as teams trying to get people to guess what these little clue words are. Very fun. Uh, Some unique games. This is a wider age range. Uh, Azul is where it's a really quick play game. You're trying to build a mural using these little colored tiles. Wingspan, you're trying to start a bird sanctuary. And the artwork is beautiful. Uh, Ticket to Ride is good for basically anyone five and up. You're buying tickets around the United States or Germany and Europe, if you uh, buy that version. But you get points for completing trips. Uh, Downforce is a really accessible racing game. Uh, I played it with a bunch of nieces and nephews this summer. Uh, ages probably 7 up to 17. And it was a hit. <laughs> Everyone loved it. So it's a, you're like a little Formula One car. And you race around. It's, it's quick play, though. Like You can play it in under a half hour. 
and Carcassonne is a great like group puzzle game. So these are all options. The only reason I gave you specifics is people think board games, they think Monopoly. And by the way, I just replayed Monopoly for the first time in a couple decades. Oh my goodness, there are no games built like that anymore. Like Monopoly, when you lose, it's not because the cards made you lose. It's because someone sitting at the table bludgeoned you until you had to forcibly sell your <laughs> possessions and give them all your money. Like that game is really, really rough. Uh, so that's not what board games are anymore. If you're thinking board games and Monopoly, please give them another try. <laughs> Cause while I really enjoyed losing in Monopoly this year, uh, it felt very personal. And I was like, Oh, this is why people fight all the time. I forgot. Uh, so those are great games. <clears throat> I will suggest just one more. I had a friend come to me like, hey, my kids are super into Star Wars. What should they play? And I'm sure you've noticed if your kids are into Star Wars, everything Star Wars is like 50% more than other things of the same variety. So Star Wars board games can be very spendy. Uh, if you want an inexpensive version, you need kids probably kind of 10 or older to be able to handle this, but it's called Edge of the Empire. Uh, it's a pen and paper tabletop game, okay? Which if probably the closest... Uh, example people will be familiar with would be something like Dungeons and Dragons, except it's Star Wars. So there's no magic um, and there's no like demons or anything. <laughs> there's just Star Wars. Star Wars has done a great job of keeping their content pretty clean. So my suggestion to this dad was, hey, you've got a, a kid in eighth grade. You've got a kid going into high school. Uh, they're old enough to make up their stories. They can handle the rules. They can play this with friends. It's a very low buy-in uh, cost, like the stuff you need. You can spend tons on it if you want, but you just need a pen, some paper, and an imagination, and like you can run with it. And it it is very fun. I'm actually playing it right now with my kids, uh, Owen and Henry, five and seven, can handle it. Although I have to make everyone robots for Henry because when given the option, Henry goes in Han Solo style. He just lasers a blazon uh, and does not ask many questions. So we had to modify that because I'm like, all right, we still got to make this line up, buddy, with what we believe. <laughs> what we believe. You can't just walk into rooms and uh, blast everybody. All right. Uh, fun facts. So anyway, that it is fun and it gives you opportunities to talk that out. Be like, interesting. Like, I know that happens in a lot of, you know, adventure movies and stuff. That's how people handle their problems. Let's talk about that because there are other ways in that game. Like, you don't have to have a weapon. You can just, I don't know, work it out other ways. So keep that in mind. Uh, I guess what's important to note here, though, to finish up this conversation of how do we find analog adventures? Well, we find them because our kids' interests, passions, and giftings. Uh, there are lots of big picture categories. We talked about art, books, and board games. Uh, and the kind of idea here, though, is just because it's analog doesn't mean it's healthful or helpful, right? There's plenty of books. There's plenty of games. There's plenty of art that is not going to benefit your child. So we do want to make sure we line up with Philippians 4.8 as a standard of what's good, and we want to make sure we celebrate what God tells us to celebrate, right? What Galatians 5.22 verses 5.19, right? We want the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the flesh, to be encouraged and to be um, borne out from our actions and, and the things that we're dedicating our hearts and minds to. So just keep that in mind, because right now, let's get down to some brass tacks. How do we make it work for your family? You're going to find what your kid's interested in. You're going to brainstorm some activities, and you're going to make sure it lines up with these three things. First, the time then the resource, and then the location, okay? Time is, is it a priority this season? And the reason I use that wording is because you're gonna use your time somewhere. We all have 24 hours in a day. So we all have time for activities. The question is, well, what's our priority? Houston Craft from Character Strong put it this way. Instead of saying, I don't have time for an activity or for uh, an action, we simply say, well, that's not a priority to me. So instead of saying, we don't have time to play that sport, we'll say, all right, playing soccer right now isn't a priority for us, right? Now, maybe that's because we're playing another sport or we have a different outlet or it's just not a good time of year for us to do it. But that kind of removes the excuse and it allows us to take an active voice in it and say, no, that's not a priority, which then forces the question of, okay, well, what is a priority? What are we putting in our calendar? What are we making space for? And are there things we should change? Then we're going, man, you know what? What we're doing right now actually doesn't reflect our family's priorities. So once we've talked about, do we have the time for this, right? Is this a priority for us? Then we go, all right, well, does it line up with our family's budget, right? It's 
awesome that we want to go do this really amazing activity. But in this season, even if it's a priority, this is really important to us. We just can't afford to do it. We got to save up for that. So keep that in mind. That is something we need to take in. We kind of, we're going to count the cost of these activities uh, so that we can make an intentional investment in that. Uh, for our family, right, that would be, we have lots of friends who love to go skiing, but for us, that's not in the budget right now. So what are we doing? We're saving up some activities for Christmas, and we're going to be asking for them, right? That's how we got the local zoo pass, was we asked grandparents, hey, our kids, they don't need a lot of gifts. Could you buy for us the local zoo pass so that we can go throughout the year? Because that for us is a priority. It's something, as I mentioned, Hadley loves, but it's an activity the boys love. They have a great play area at one of these local parks. Um, and our kids can go out there and play for a couple hours. We can do that with friends. We can get outside on the rare Northwest days in the fall, winter, and early spring where that's an option. Uh, and it is it is a great opportunity. So that's something we're thinking with money. We recognize, well, we can't do it, but we want to do it. Or for an, ex oh, and then location, <clears throat> location or specialist. So we make sure we have time priority. We make sure we have money priority. Uh, and then we have the location. So Owen uh, loves this Young Life event we used to do called Battle Club, where basically you get giant foam swords, shields, bows and arrows, spears, and you go out on a field and you just play tag, basically, right? Super fun, but we haven't been able to do it because of COVID. Uh, so he is really excited about figuring out where this is. So we're making it a priority. Now, it takes a lot of space. We can't play it in the concrete cul-de-sac outside our house. But we know that schools nearby allow you to rent their fields for relatively cheap. It's like, I think, 20 bucks for an hour or something. So for a fairly small amount of money, uh, we can go out, we can take all this equipment and we can go have some fun with friends and have a good time. And that's the kind of analog adventure that Owen would enjoy, right? It's something we can afford. And that's something I want to say yes to, right? Because it fits the priority of time of money and we have a location to do it. So keep in mind, as we talk about this conversation today, we have made sure that uh, first, we're removing anything that distracts us because if our tech is unhealthy, right, our hearts will become unhealthy. So we want to make sure that that's the first thing. And the goal of it is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And out of that, we're going to say yes to as much as we can because we love our kids. And we're going to ask God for the wisdom and discernment for how to say yes. If they ask us for stuff that's not helpful, not healthy for them, we're going to say no, but let's look at this. We're going to do that by looking at their interests, passion, giftings right? What makes this kid tick? Then we're going to look at all sorts of analog adventure options, right? These things that happen at the pace of real life that are uh, pro-social and they, they are going to build life skills that our kids will be able to take with them and develop parts of our kids that uh, are going to help them reflect more of who God's made them to be. And finally, we're going to make sure we have the time priority, we have the resource, and we have the location or the specialist. Like, there's some things that I don't know how to do, but I can send my son to piano lessons, or I can send my my daughter to, right, a specialist in dance or gymnastics, which is what she's going to be getting into. And, right, that's, that's great. I don't have to know that. I can instead know someone who does, and those can be useful resources. So I hope this was encouraging to you. I hope you can hear this and go, yeah, you know what, like... I see how I was thinking about tech and that there are these other options in front of us. And uh, it can feel very intimidating, parents, to think about these op opportunities and try to feel like, man, I, need, I should go out and do this other thing, or my kids shouldn't be using tech that much. And I, I want to encourage you in that. That's not what this conversation's about. Just look at your child's tech. Hopefully, you have a family tech framework. Right, where you can say this is or is not healthful. This is or is not what my child wants for themselves and what I want for them and what God's called me to be as a parent, giving them good things, right? So my hope is you feel encouraged in that. And maybe they're not healthy. I hope you feel encouraged about the next step. You now have the words to go speak. Say, hey, son or daughter, I love you. I'm noticing this thing is unhealthful for you, right? We're going to set up family expectations for technology, and a part of that is we're going to find you amazing things that you can do. Maybe you can't do all of them. Maybe I can't send you to space camp right now, but we can do this one thing. We can do this club. We can do this thing with your friends. We can do this big activity. We can save up for that camp, right? We can do this because we love you, and we want to have that conversation. And parents, what you're doing when you raise your kids in that way is you're actually raising them up in the way they should go. You're showing them this is what it looks like to love somebody. This is what it looks like to intervene in an unhealthy situation. This is what it looks like to set a firm standard and point someone's eyes 
back to Christ because we're not going to settle for convenient. We're not going to settle for safe and happy. Instead, we're going to push our children and push ourselves back to Scripture, back to the basics of who God is calling us uh, to be, and then we're going to do what he tells us to do. We're going to love others. We're going to love our enemies, and we're going to love God with all we are, right, and make disciples in the process. So, um, man, I hope you're encouraged in it. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me, Nathan at gospeltech.net, or you can follow us on social media, Instagram and Facebook. It's at Love God, use tech. You can even just direct message us right on there. Uh, yeah, I hope this was helpful to you. If it was, please share it with somebody. Let us know what you think uh, and join us next week as we continue this conversation about how we can love God and use tech. <laughs> <laughs>